Hi, and welcome to the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. I'm your host, Tom Rosenbauer, and in this episode, we're gonna learn all about finding fish in moving water. Trout don't live everywhere in a stream. Their distribution is sometimes fairly spotty, and without a knowledge of exactly where the fish live and where they feed, all the casting and fly knowledge in the world won't do you any good. So we're gonna show you some tricks on finding fish in moving water in this episode. Hope you enjoy it. Nice fish! That fish has already refused that fly. You're gonna have to try just a slightly different pattern. The roll cast pickup is a great cast to use in a lot of fishing situations. This is a beautiful wild trout from a small stream. Just a gorgeous little fish. I say hit that bank. Let's go to that grass bed. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing. Algoma Country. Destination Ontario. Main Office of Tourism. Yellowstone Teton Territory. Crazy Rainbow Ranch. Bahamas Tourism. Adipose Boat Works. Global Rescue. Trout Unlimited. We all have those days when a river seems to be devoid of fish. And unless conditions are just right, it's almost impossible to spot trout below the surface when they're not feeding. Let's face it, on most days you venture forth on a trout stream, you probably won't see fish rising, at least not all the time, unless you're incredibly lucky. That's when you call on your best stream reading skills to take a stab at where trout might be feeding. These are skills you can use no matter what kind of fishing you do, whether you fish with a fly, cast a spinning lure, or fish a small stream with a worm. It helps to understand just what a trout needs in order to survive. Yes, they do need shelter and protection from predators, and often they live right next to cover. But even more important to us as anglers is that they need to feed without wasting more energy than they obtain in getting a meal. Current brings food to trout, but it also exhausts them if they have to fight it all the time. So to put it in a nutshell, a trout likes to live in slow to moderate current with faster water close by. This faster water can either be to one side of them or above them. They hold their position in moderate current without wasting energy and make brief forays into faster water to grab a meal. We call this boundary between fast and slow water a seam and it's often visible on the surface. This slower water can be behind in front of, or along the sides of an object, or it can be close to the bottom. Anytime moving water encounters a solid object, it slows down and creates a boundary layer of slower water. And it's in this boundary layer that you find trout. Deep slow pools with log jams might hold trout, but those trout may not be feeding. They might be frightened or resting, but they just might respond to a well-presented streamer even though they're not actively feeding. Scientists have shown that most trout like to live in water that runs about one foot per second with fast water close by where they can dart into the faster water to feed. They also need shelter from predators either adjacent to them or a quick flip of the tail away. Cover can be an overhanging tree or a big rock, but deep water and riffles also offer protection. Trout have many predators, and they can disappear into a riffle or a deep pool as quickly as they can bury themselves in a log jam. Notice how this fish was both on a seam and in front of that big rock. Knew there was a fish in there. Get him in close. Shorter rod helps. When you're when you're netting a, or landing a fish by yourself in a long rod, hold him in the clear water over here. 
until he's ready to go. And he's ready to go. It really helps to get a good overview of the water you're gonna fish before you start. Get high up if you can, either on a high bank or a bridge, or even look at a satellite image of a place you intend to fish. Try to estimate where the best water is, because trout don't live everywhere in a river, and it's very difficult to get a good perspective on what kind of water is ahead once you get down into the water. Trout can feed in water from riffles that are so shallow their backs are almost out of the water to 20 foot deep pools. But in general, you'll find most trout feeding in water that's from about two to six feet deep. In large, deep rivers, look for the shallower places. And in small, shallow streams, look for the deep spots. Unless you see fish feeding or know where some trout feed from past experiences, look for structures in the current, including a rough bottom filled with large rocks, a bank lined with down trees or riffles at the heads of pools, and the smooth water at the tails of pools. In otherwise featureless water like the slow middle portion of a pool, look for the central thread of current that runs down through the pool. You can find this place by looking for the concentration of bubbles and other debris that run down through a pool. It may not always run right down the center of the pool, but can favor one side or the other, or it can be found in back eddies. In the head of this pool, the riffle dumps swiftly into a deeper place, and there's almost always a shelf at the head of a riffle that keeps trout out of the current but gives them a constant supply of food overhead. Also at the head of pools is a seam on either side of the current that provides that balance between fast water for feeding and slower water for relief from the current. Often the heads of pools will be found at the bend in a river, and if the water is very fast, most fish will be found on the inside of the bend. But if the water is slower, more fish will be found in the middle of the river or on the outside of the bend because that's where more food will be drifting. The middle of a pool is often just plain harder to read. You don't have the same distinct features as at the head of the pool, so you have to look further. Look for bigger rocks, either above the surface or swirls on the surface that show larger submerged rocks. Don't forget, that the swirl caused by a submerged rock will be downstream of the rock itself. And trout are more likely to be ahead of the rock than behind it. So lead this plume of water generously when you cast your fly. Watch for that bubble line because all the food drifting down through the pool will be concentrated near it and so will the fish. And don't forget the banks. Look for water along the banks that is between two to six feet deep and then look for logs, rocks, shade, or tiny projections in the bank that provide protection from current and predators. The tails of pools always hold feeding trout, and often the biggest trout in a pool will slide down into the tail to feed during hatches. In the tail, the current concentrates the food both vertically and horizontally and a shelf is formed where the bottom rises up just before the tail breaks over into the next riffle. One of the things that uh, small stream anglers often overlook are the tails of the pools where the water just starts to, just starts to dump down into the next riffle. The tails of the pools can be one of the best places for trout because all of the food in this little pocket is being concentrated in the tail of the pool. And what happens is most often we spook those fish because we stand up and we go right up to the head of the pocket. But if you try a first few casts down low into the tail of the pool, you may be surprised. Sometimes the biggest fish in a, in a small stream like this are going to be at the tail of the pool. Trout will be found in front of rocks or along their sides as often as they will be found behind them. Oh, ha <laughs> Right in front of a rock. R Whoa! <laughs> right in front of a rock, right where that fish was supposed to be. Fish are just as often to be found in front of rocks as they are behind rocks. It's a, a beautiful little wild rainbow, I think. Strong, frisky, 
Gallon River Rainbow, he took the elk hair caddis, the smaller fly. What a pretty fish. The current digs a depression in front of rocks and often along their sides that gives trout a better crack at drifting food than behind a rock. The same goes for fallen trees and logs. I'd be willing to bet you'll find more trout in front of a fallen tree, which fishermen call sweepers, than behind it because the tree often strains a lot of the food from the water before it gets to the trout and funnels it to the very best place near a fallen tree at its outside point. Some rivers have few defined pools or go for miles without a single distinct pool, like this water in the Yellowstone River. In that case, you have to carefully read the entire river to discover where trout will be found. One of the best places to find fish in a river like the Yellowstone is along the banks. In some big rivers, it's about the only place to consistently find fish feeding because the current out in the center of the river is just too fast for fish to feed. Guide Molly Seminick has a nice, concise way of describing where to look for fish in big rivers. So Molly, where should I be looking when we're, when we're floating? We're moving pretty quickly. Where should I be looking relative to the boat? Tom, you want to look downriver because the, the boat will catch up quickly. So if you look downriver, you'll try to think about where you want to put your fly. And look for structures like rocks. Rocks rock. Wood is good. Foam is home. Shade. Made in the shade. That's a new one. I like that. Pocket water is water with lots of big rocks and tumbling currents and is some of the most challenging but productive water to fish. Here, instead of looking at individual rocks, look for places where a jumble of rocks creates a tiny pool. You really have to narrow down your fishing options in pocket water because all of it looks fishy, but pocket water is tough to fish and tough to navigate. So step back and look over the water to find the most likely places. You might notice that I'm taking really short casts in this pocket water. Your flies are going to get drowned very quickly. Plus, you're not going to get a very long drag-free float. So you want to just kind of pick pockets. You want to walk up through here and poke it here, poke it here, poke it here, poke it here. Just put it in all the little pockets, especially when you know there's fish that are willing to feed. That makes it a lot more fun. Unfortunately, you won't always find your favorite trout stream in perfect shape. Spring runoff, sudden rainstorms, and periodic dam releases can turn that crystal clear stream into chocolate milk. You don't have to give up though. Trout can see surprisingly well in dirty water and may even take a dry fly if they're in water that's shallow enough for them to see the surface. Where do trout go during high water? Sometimes they don't move at all because most of the force of a flood is concentrated in the faster main channel of the river and the velocity in a trout's lie, already protected from the current, doesn't really change that much. But in high water, some fish will move into the shallow margins along the banks. And because it's difficult for us to get a fly down to those fish in really heavy water, sometimes the only game in town is fishing along the banks. Ha! Yes! That's nice. what I wanted for Tom. Thank yes. you, Molly. Oh. In general, during floods, I'd concentrate along the banks and in slower pools. But just be careful of your wading. You won't be able to see bottom, and the force of the current will be greater than you're used to. Probably the best strategy in high water is to use a streamer with a bulky profile. Trout can sense vibrations in the water with their lateral line sense, and bulky streamers create vibrations in the water that trout can hear. Low clear water is not as difficult to fish as high dirty water, and in some ways easier because the trout will be concentrated in fewer places. In low water, the current's always slower, so look for that bubble line that indicates where the food will be drifting. Trout will be right under it. If the weather's hot, also look for oxygenated water like riffles or pocket water because trout need high concentrations of dissolved oxygen to live, especially when the water temperature is above 65 degrees. And if you catch fish when water temperatures are in the high 60s, play them quickly and release them quickly. And you should stop fishing when water temperatures hit 70 degrees because fish get so stressed that you can play them to exhaustion and kill them. One of the most important considerations when fishing low water is stealth. 
drought face into the current. Some people say they face that way because that's where their food comes from. But truly, trout face that way because they're designed to. They can't hold their position when facing down current. So when approaching fish, especially in low water, it's often easiest from a position downstream of the fish because they can't see so well directly behind them. Trout have a window from which they can observe the outside world. And the physics of that get more complicated than I want to discuss. Actually, because I don't totally understand the physics behind it. But be aware that the deeper a trout lies in the water, the more it can see the outside world. There are a number of things you can do to avoid spooking trout. Why should you worry about that? Because once a trout is frightened, it won't feed for anywhere from a few minutes to many hours. If they're scared, they don't eat. It's as simple as that. All right, our next pocket is up here on the other side of this boulder. I'm gonna sneak up, close as I can, keeping my profile low so I don't spook the fish. And again, using that high rod tip, throwing my fly up over the boulder. Try, I usually like to try the good spots first because every, every subsequent cast you make, you take the chance of spooking the fish. So I try to make my first cast count and put it in the best spot. And then I'll work over to some smaller spots that aren't quite as good, maybe a little shallower, but you never know. Fish aren't always where they're supposed to be. One of, one of the things that you want to be uh, aware of in small streams is, is always to turn around and look behind you. And there are two reasons that you want to look behind you. One is, obviously, that you want to make sure that you're not going to catch your back ass in a tree. But one of the other things is you always want to have some kind of cover behind you, whether it's a rock or a high bank or a tree. Because if you're, if you're silhouetted against the sky and you're moving your arm or your head, that instantly alerts the fish just to something that's not right and there's a predator above them. So always try to use the background to your advantage. Always turn around. Clothing color in small stream fishing is relatively important. You want to wear something like this green that kind of matches the foliage behind you. I don't think you have to go crazy and, and get a camouflage shirt or camouflage waders, but you should try to match the background. So a green, a tan, a brown is good in a situation like this. Approach is especially critical on small streams, but the techniques you learn there can be applied to rivers of any size. For reading the water in approaching fish, casting accuracy is really important. Let's visit Pete Kutzer to learn the five most common casting mistakes. Today we're going to troubleshoot the five most common casting mistakes and how to correct them. Probably the number one most common casting mistake I see is starting with that raw tip too high. When you start your initial back cast, you want to keep that rod tip nice and low, close to the water. That's going to keep that line nice and straight and make that nice, easy back cast, that nice lift and acceleration and that pop to a stop. If you start with your back or rod tip up too high, you're going to have the tendency to dip a little bit behind you and maybe send that back cast down into the water. So start with that rod tip nice and low, make a smooth acceleration to that pop to a stop. The second most common casting mistake is probably not stopping the rod, keeping this rod moving in a continuous motion. Remember, we have to stop and pause and wait for that line to roll out. And it's that stop that transfers the energy from that bent rod into the line. So when you're casting, think of an abrupt stop and an abrupt stop on both the back cast and the forward cast to help get that line out and that fly out on target. The third most common casting mistake is probably going too far back with the rod. Starting with that rod tip nice and low, coming up and then down on that back cast. That again is gonna send your line down into the water, making that fly probably splat on the water, getting stuck in a tree or a bush and not creating a nice tight loop. So just think, stop that rod tip up and back or imagine you have that wall up against you, not too far back. You don't wanna go through that wall behind you. The fourth most common thing I usually see when somebody's casting is they have a tendency when they get something in their hand, they want to help it. They want to try and throw it as far as they can. These fly rods, they'll do the work for you if you let them. When you make that forward cast, notice when I make that cast that my arm is pretty compact, pretty relaxed. It's just right in here. Not too far forward, not too far back. 
what I see is this, a tendency to want to throw that line and kind of help that rod out there. If you do that, that's going to have a tendency to throw your line uphill. You could potentially cause a tailing loop. That's your line hitting itself, and that's a little segue into number five. But we want that nice, smooth pop to a stop, not too much extension, nice and easy. Just think you wouldn't tack a nail into a wall out here, just right here, nice and easy. The fifth most common thing I see is probably that tailing loop. Now that tailing loop is when that fly line hits itself and causes a knot. If that happens, a lot of times people like to say it's because of the wind, it's a wind knot. You may have heard that before. Well, the reality is it's usually a bad casting knot. And it can be caused by three different ways. One way is by punching. You're kind of thrusting that rod tip forward. That's gonna cause that line to hit itself, causing that knot. Another way, is by having too short of a casting stroke for the length of line. That's how far back I go to how far forward I go. From here to here, that's my casting stroke, here to here. If it's too short for the length of line, that's gonna cause that line to hit itself and cause that tailing loop. And probably the third uh, reason why we get tailing loops, and this is probably the most common, is we're trying to apply that flick or that pop right in the beginning. Remember, when we cast, we want to make this smooth acceleration to a stop, smooth acceleration to a stop. If we flick in the beginning, there, that's going to cause that tailing loop. Think pop to a stop, don't pop in the beginning and then bring the rod down. Get that smooth acceleration to a stop and that's going to give you a nice loop rolling out to those fish. You know, trout are fascinating creatures and I don't think there's a fishing trip that goes by that I don't learn something new about trout and where they live in streams. When you're fishing, take the time to observe. Every time you catch a fish, say, why was that fish there? Why did I catch that fish there? If you do that with some time on the water, you'll be well on your way to learning how to read a trout stream. The ultimate guide to fly fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing. Algoma Country. Destination Ontario. Main Office of Tourism. Yellowstone Teton Territory. Crazy Rainbow Ranch. Bahamas Tourism. Adipose Boat Works. Global Rescue. Trout Unlimited.